Hi class, this is your instructor, Scholar Huff, and welcome to chapter 53. This is your introduction to ecology by way of population ecology. The science of ecology is a study of how living organisms and their physical environment interact in an immense and complicated web of relationships. Biologists call the interactions among biotic factors and those between organisms and their non-living physical environment abiotic factors. So keep those in mind, the biotic as well as abiotic factors and those interactions. So abiotic factors include things such as precipitation, temperature, wind, pH, and chemical nutrients. Ecologists formulate hypotheses to explain such phenomena as the distribution and abundance of life, the ecological roles of specific species, the interactions among species in communities, and the importance of ecosystems in maintaining the health of the biosphere. They then test these hypotheses. So the focus of ecology can be local or global, specific or generalized, depending on the questions the scientist is asking and trying to answer. Ecology is the broadest field in biology, with explicit links to evolution and every other biological discipline, which reminds me of my days at Mississippi State University with EEB, Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. It includes studies on the transfer of information among organisms and analyses of the transfer of energy for life. Its universality encompasses subjects that are not traditionally part of biology. Earth science, geology, chemistry, oceanography, climatology, and meteorology are extremely important to ecology, especially when ecologists examine the abiotic environment of planet Earth. So this takes me back to the days of graduate school at Mississippi State, thinking about predicting species distributions using just, of course, that minimum temperature and maximum temperature, two key factors in species distribution. So because humans are part of Earth's web of life, all our activities, including economics and politics, have profound ecological implications. Environmental science, a scientific discipline that, with ties to ecology, focuses on how humans interact with the environment. So as you all learned back in your first biology course, most ecologists are interested in levels in the levels of biological organization, including and above the level of the individual organism. Hence, we go from population ecology or the population level to community ecology or eco or community level, then to the ecosystem, the landscape, and ultimately to the biosphere. So each level has its own characteristic composition, structure, and functioning. An individual belongs to a population, which is defined as being a group consisting of members of the same species that live together in a prescribed area at the same time. So the boundaries of the area are defined by the ecologist performing a particular study. A population ecologist might study a population of microorganisms, animals, or plants, like the poet's daffodils in the photograph shown class here on page 1151. And they do that to see how individuals within it live and interact with one another, with other species in the community, and with their physical environment. So here in this chapter, we begin our study of ecological principles by focusing on the study of populations as functioning systems and end with a study of the human population. So we'll continue this class for this next test in subsequent chapters with the interactions among different populations in the community, being the 54th chapter, the dynamic exchanges between communities and their physical environments in the 55th chapter. We'll get to characteristics of the Earth's major biological ecosystems in the 56th chapter, and then end things with biolog biological diversity and conservation biology in the 57th chapter. Let us now begin with features of populations. So keep in mind 
the information prior, the information just given, just please be sure that you all are taking the time to study this information because it's important to know what we're doing now to ensure class it makes sense in, of course, an ecological sense. So let us now continue on with where we are. So we've already gotten to those levels of biological organization, which was, which was nothing new. So features of population begin as they characterize the population, including the population density, population dispersion, the birth and death rates, including growth rates, and survivorship with age structure. So just keep in mind that population ecology includes both the number of individuals of a particular species that are found in an area and the dynamics of the population. So when I refer to population dynamics, I'm referring to just those changes, meaning studying the changes within the populations. And it's the how and why the numbers increase or decrease over time. So population ecologists, they try to determine the processes common to all populations and even studying how the population interacts with its, its environment such as how the individuals in the population compete for food or other resources and how predation, disease, and other environmental pressures affect the population. So it's of course population growth, meaning whether, meaning whether of bacteria, maples, or giraffes cannot increase indefinitely because of such environmental pressures. So keep all of this in mind. And there are other aspects of populations that interest biologists, such as, of course, their reproductive success or failure, which would lead to extinction, their evolution, their genetics, and even the, the way they affect normal functioning of communities in ecosystems. So biologists in applied disciplines, such as forestry or agronomy, which of course is crop science, and even wildlife management, must understand population ecology to manage those populations of economic importance, such as the forests, the field crops, and game animals or fishes, such as the white-tailed deer, or those fishes that you all enjoy fishing for, if you happen to be one who fishes. So understanding the population dynamics of endangered and threatened species plays a key role in the efforts to prevent their slide to extinction. So it's this knowledge of population ecology that helps in efforts to prevent the increase of pest populations to levels that cause significant economic or health threats. So here I just say that populations do share that common gene pool. And of course, it's by way of natural selection that of course acts directly on those allele frequencies to produce the adaptive changes in the population. And just keep in mind class, it's not it that evolves or that that evolves. It's of course populations that evolve, not individuals. So, having gotten to those things, what I'll now continue on to class is population density. So, the concept of population size is meaningful only when the boundaries of that population are defined. And, as I say that, just consider the difference between 1,000 mice on 250 acres and 1,000 1, mice on 2.5 acres. That's a big difference. So, Given that difference, it's often that the population is too large to study in its entirety. So researchers must examine such a population by sampling a part of it and then expressing the population in terms of density. So examples include the number of dandelions per square meter of your, of your lawn or the number of water fleas per liter of pond water and even class the number of cabbage aphids per square centimeter of cabbage leaf. So when you think of population density class, as defined, it is the number of individuals of a species and it's per unit area or volume class at a given time. And keep in mind, that's majorly important. So with that, it's, it's different environments that vary in the population density of any species that they can support. So it's the density that may also vary in a single habitat seasonally, or even class year after year. So red grouse are ground-dwelling game birds whose populations are managed for hunting. So consider, consider two red grouse populations in the treeless moors of this 
here in your text refers to northwestern Scotland. So in these two locations, they're about a mile and a half apart. So at one location, the population density remained stationary during that three-year period. But at the other site, it almost doubled in the first two years, then declined to its initial density in the third year. The likely reason for this is a difference in habitat. So researchers had to experiment, had experimentally burned the area where the population density increased initially and then decreased. So young heather shoots produced after the burn provided nutritious food for the red grouse. So it's the population density that, of course, made determined large, largely in part by both the biotic or even the abiotic factors in that environment that are external to the individuals in that population. So keep this in mind, class, when you go to a place and you see lots of this species, or you see very few of this species, by way of density, meaning highly densely populated or not too densely populated. It's not just that. It could be other factors at work, as just mentioned. So here, class, I'll get to the individuals in a population often exhibit characteristic patterns of dispersion. Or when you speak of dispersion class, dispersion is defined as spacing relative to one another. So there are three differing types of dispersion we'll get to. Before I get to dispersion, let's get to things that you all know a lot about. So I leave here with population density, which we have just com completed, or at least to complete it more formally. I show you this class. This is a map of the United States population density. So I would hope that as you look here, you see areas in which you can likely relate, such as, I guess you say, the area around there. So looking at this map, you can see, class, that there is an approximate less than 10, less than 10, of course, when it's kind of, a, I say, a tan color. And then it's then, class, by county, it's more than 250, or 250 or more, rather, meaning the population density per square mile when it's red. So with this in mind, I thought about going even a step further to show you all something that you all can relate to. So I have a selection class of six Alabama counties with two counties class at the bottom that are not in Alabama. And then in the center, I have the 2019 population estimate. And then on the right-hand side, I have the 2010 population density per square mile. So this information came from, of course, the United States Census Bureau. So if you look closely, it's estimated that Baldwin County had a density in 2009 of over 223,000 people. Clark County had only 23,000 people per square mile. Excuse me, 23,000 people in total. Excuse me. Jefferson County had 658,000 people. And, of course, you can see Mobile as well as Madison counties. And then Escambia County with 36,000 people estimated. So looking at those, look to the right-hand side, to that very last column, and you will see stark differences, I would say, in population density. So I'm unsure whether or not you all live here in Baldwin County or Madison County or even Mobile County or Jefferson County. But as you can see, class, the population density seen class in Clark County is 20 people, well, 20.9 people per square mile. Looking at Escambia County, there's a few more at 40.5 people per square mile. And then, of course, you get to Mobile County with an estimated 335.9 people per square mile. And, of course, you see in Jefferson County class, there are estimated to be 592.5 people per square mile. So with that, look even closer class at Fulton County, Georgia. There's an estimated class 1,748 people per square mile there. And uh, if you haven't noticed yet, class, that's from, of course, the county in which Atlanta is located. And it's estimated class that there are that there is over 1 million people in that county. Excuse me. And then you look at Miami-Dade County, which of course is located in Florida, and you see that there are over 2.7 million people living there, with an estimated density class being 1,315.5 people per square mile. 
So I hope this gives you a pretty good indication class as far as why, I guess you would say even traffic is such a deal, living class in this place or that place, if every class you've driven through these areas, which I think that you'll have driven through at least Mobile County and even Baldwin County. So now back to dispersion. So there are three types of dispersion patterns. So individuals may be spaced in a random fashion, randomly dispersed, in a clump pattern, or being uniformly dispersed. So first things first, class, we here have random dispersion. So I'll say random dispersion class is something that is rare to find in nature. I state that because what's typical is that it's rarely, if ever, seen because species class are not going to be randomly dispersed. Well, you find species where we find species is just not by chance. In other words, class, it's going to be clump dispersion, meaning the most common one seen, and it's all because of the patch of resources, meaning there may be a bumper crop class of acorns. There may be a great source of water, or it could just be an amazing place class for those fish to hide on, underneath that log or within that tree. So as this is the case class, the schooling behavior class helps the fish you see class on page 1,153. These are blue striped snappers you see there. So it's, it's advantageous to, of course, be in the school. And just as you may, may also see that there is a patch of grass, not necessarily that it's a benefit of that patch of grass to be there, but that grass is their class, likely because, of course, it's, I guess you say, damp there, as opposed to being way over there somewhere else. So it's not by chance, class, that species are where they are. They are going to be clumped, class, because of the presence of resources. And I can't stress this enough. It's because of the distribution of resources in the environment, and that is the reason why. And even class with trees, in, in the case class of aspen trees, they may originate class asexually from a single plant, and then, of course, it just might very well be that if they were not classed in that school, such as we see these fish here class, that those predators class, I would just say that... Uh, could much more easily class eat them. Up next class is uniform distribution. So with uniform distribution class, this is one that you will not will not see class a lot of. But of course, between individuals class, the competition is severe, and animals establish this for either mating territories or to establish feeding. So in this photograph class, seeing uniform dispersion, which I say you don't see really often, is going to be classed with these Cape Gannets off the coast of South Africa. So here, the birds, they place and space those nests more or less class evenly. This is uniform dispersion. So keeping in mind class, it, it will not be class random. It could be class uniform, but the one class most often seen in nature is clump dispersion. So there we have it, class. And from here, we'll move on class to changes in population size. So as far as changes in population size class, I hope that you all can explain, the, of course, the meaning of a few terms as we continue here, such as, I guess I'll just go ahead with natality, mortality, immigration, and, and immigration. So getting to this, it's one goal of science to, to discover those common patterns among separate observations, meaning that population ecologists wish to understand the general processes that sh that are shared by many different populations so they can develop mathematical models based on equations that describe the dynamics of a single population. So population models are not perfect representations of a population, but those models definitely help to illuminate those complex processes. And, and along that same note, Mathematical model, modeling enhances it enhances the scientific process, providing that framework with which experimental population studies can be compared. So here we test a model to see how it fits or does not fit with existing data. 
So data that are inconsistent with the model are particularly useful because they demand that we ask how the natural system differs from the mathematical model that we developed to explain it. So as more knowledge accumulates from those observations and experiments, the model is refined to make more and made more and more precise. So keep this in, I guess I'll say in mind class, that population size changes over time. So given that, it's of course, whether it's a sunflower, an elephant, a human, whatever that population is class, it changes over time. And globally, this change is ultimately caused by two factors, and typical of which is for this to be expressed on a per capita or per individual basis. So natality is the average birth, I repeat, the average per capita birth rate, and more mortality is that average per capita death rate. So in us, called humans class, birth rate is usually expressed as the number of births per 1,000 people per year, and death rate, of course, as that number of deaths per 1,000 people per year. And keep in mind, as we look at this class, you should look at the pop clock. I did say that, pop clock. So the population clock class, by way of that Census Bureau, shows the population class changing over time. It shows the class changing through time. And if you haven't seen it yet, class, I do recommend you look at it. Because by seeing this, I, I know for a fact it should give you an indication of how population is in fact changing. So this is what I was just referring to, class. And I'll scroll down here. Yes, the U.S. Census Bureau. And that is it. So if you can look closely, class, what we see is that the world population, it's, 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 there you go. And yet the same class, you can look at the United States population shown to the left. It is, I guess you would say increasing, but I would say nothing like class, the world population, which of course is right now at 7.6 billion. So you also have on the right hand side, the 10 most populous countries with China being number one, followed by India, and not far behind, I say. And then thereafter, class, we ultimately get to the United States. So they're the, the top three most populous countries. To the left-hand side, class, meaning looking at these components of population change, there's a the birth class every eight seconds. Yes, I waited eight seconds. And then one death every 12 seconds. I won't wait 12 seconds. And I would also mention here, class, that there is an international migrant class every 47 seconds. Every 47 seconds. So keep in mind, class, that no matter what is done, there is an international migrant class entering the country. And then there is a net gain class of one person every 18 seconds. So I'm saying all of this to ensure that you know, class, that population, I repeat, it changes over time. And you're seeing that class right here before your eyes. So now that we're here, class, just keep in mind that that delta that you see here, class, is ensuring that you know that there is change. So change in the number of individuals, class, over that period of time. Because, of course, time indeed does change. Delta change. So given that class, we have the equation that gives you such there. So the growth rate, the growth rate as we get to it here class or, or rate of change, meaning an increase or decrease of a population on that per capita basis is the birth rate minus the death rate, as you see it right here. So on the test class, given Given, I guess you say, if this class is greater than this, I hope you can provide class the effect class on that rate of growth, or that rate of change in the population. And yet the same class, if I were to reverse that, and write that as being, if this class were that, I hope you can give me the effect class all the same. And then ultimately class, if I were to do this and ask for this 
this, what effect class would that have on the rate of change? Ha, ha, ha. In the meantime, class, let's continue moving on. So now on to dispersal. So dispersal class definitely affects the rate of growth in some populations. So it must be taken into consideration class with the change at local scales. So we have immigration class, and that is occurring when individuals enter the population class and increase that population's size. But yet in steel class, immigration also occurs, and that occurs class when, of course, individuals leave that population and decrease its size. So with those, take those into account class in the very same formulas. And, and with that in mind, class, we can work this out, but I don't intend to class give you any of these to work out in your, in your exam. So now we get to intrinsic rate of population increase. So is that maximum rate at which the population of a given species could increase under those ideal conditions? And of course, this is when resources are abundant and its population density is relatively low. So different species have different intrinsic rates of increase. And... I'll say that's all I'll give you that, but that's what it's referring to class with at R max. So what we now get to class is known as exponential growth or exponential population growth. We're now class have moved over to page 1155. So as we are here class, it's just that plot of population size versus time over or at least versus time. And I guess you say this is in those conditions that are optimal, whatever that means. So as you see it class here, yes, it's delta N over delta T class, giving us that rate of that growth to pop here. So if we were to plot this class, yes, this is also known as that J-shaped curve. And with this, it's acceleration, accelerating population growth. And it's, it's a curve class, meaning as the larger the population gets, faster it grows. So with this in mind, can a population sustain exponential growth class? Alrighty then. So I would hope having thought about that class, you now understand that this is something that is called to be theoretical in that no population class can grow exponentially class indefinitely. And, and I say that because at some point there will be a struggle for existence. That struggle may be class B because of the lack of resources or a lack of space. In any case class, this can occur, but it will not class continue on class indefinitely. So this is known as exponential growth class, that J-shaped curve. So next up, we have, of course, those environmental limits that I kind of spoke to here. So I said that an organism class cannot reproduce indefinitely at that intrinsic rate. And the limitations class are there in resources, meaning a place to live, something to eat, and even class water and other essential resources class. Not to mention class, the competition, and even disease with, of course, predation. We'll come back to those class factors uh, here shortly. Keep those in mind. Keep those in mind. And so as, as those limits class are reached, we're getting, of course, nearer and nearer to the, the limits of the environment, then, of course, the population growth may decrease class to nearly zero. So here we're going to get to what is known as carrying capacity. So I speak to carrying capacity as being the largest population class. I repeat, it's that largest population that can be sustained indefinitely class, assuming that there is no change in the environment. So given that, let's keep in mind class that yes, we're dealing with mathematical models here still. And I just would not necessarily say that any population class ever reaches what is known as carry capacity. I would say population just, I would say they hover or they may be within the range of some carrying capacity. So next week we get to what is called class logistic growth. And keep in mind, you will see these on your test. So with what is called logistic growth, what we have with this class is known as the S-shaped curve. So yet and still the number of individuals in this class over time, showing the growth of which. So there is class that start or that lag phase that you have 
here, and then after the lag phase, we then get their class to what is known as exponential growth until that leveling out occurs class as the population approaches or reaches carrying capacity, known as K. And we have our equation here class to get such. So just keep in mind that we do have that initial exponential increase until that leveling out occurs as the population reaches that carrying capacity. So I would say this would be something that is more realistic to see, but yet it's still class. I would not say that populations necessarily do indeed reach carrying capacity. They may class just hover near some level of carrying capacity. So the population mentions that a crash could very well occur, meaning I mentioned this moments ago, but just keep in mind class that it's not classically to see that, oh, that population is at K called carrying capacity. They class just hover around here and even there. So now we get to factors influencing population size. As we continue here, class, I would say this is something to know for your test as far as being the homework, test homework, as something that you all should be able to describe in writing, or at least by, of course, having an open-ended response. So the two types of categories here, class, are those that are density-dependent factors, as well as those density-independent factors, class, that affect, of course, well, the size of the population, or even the density of population. So if a change in a population density alters how an environmental factor affects a population, then that environmental factor class is dependent on the density of the population. And of course, effects of that density dependent factor on that population growth, it increases class as the population density does also increase. I'll make that make a lot more sense class here. So as I get to those density dependent factors, I say these are what regulate the population at that relatively constant size near carrying capacity, as you as you hope now remember. So I call this that a negative feedback system. So they're here class and they tend to slow population growth by causing an increase in death rate or even class a decrease in birth rate. The density class of that population does indeed decline. So to, to help you with this class, there are a few things that I'll use as examples here. So things that are examples class are things such as predation, meaning the predator-prey interactions class. If there are a lot of this species, of course, then that species can eat more of those. Maybe it's that Snickers bar of the desert, so to speak. And it could also be disease. Keep in mind, class, if in fact you think of the island of Gulf Shores, and let's just say that it had a population that was, let's just say a population of 25 people. I would not class necessarily state that disease would be an issue class on that island. However, class, if Island of Gulf Shores had a population of, let's just jump off the map and say 1,500,000 people, I say definitely class then to be restricted class of that small island, disease would indeed class be an issue. And then, of course, as recently stated class, begin to be an issue class, not just for birth rate, but an issue class in death rate, because, of course, disease likely would be rampant and begin to, of course, go from point A to point B. But getting back class to the animal kingdom, it's, it's when class, the population reaches a certain density, that competition is an issue. And yes, competition class. You say, what do you mean? Well, as competition class is defined, which on your test, you all should be able to define what is competition, including the two types, i.e., competition class is an interaction between two or more individuals that attempt to use the same essential resource in limited supply. You say resource? Yes. Resources class includes sunlight. Resources include water and minerals. It includes space, food, or even cover. So with those examples class, competition is real when that density class has increased. I'll go back to my first example. If in fact class, there is a place in the jungle in which there are only, let's say, 10 individuals, depending on species, of course, that might not be class such a high density. However, class, if that group of individuals of that same species live in a given area at that certain time happens to increase in number class from, I guess you would say 10 
to let's just go off the deep end class and say 300,000 individuals, I would most definitely class say that a competition would be an indeed, an indeed issue. Let's get to the plant kingdom. So in plants class, you must have A, space, you must have class B, water and minerals, and C class, sunlight. If in fact those species class happen to get to that, of course, density that's high enough for competition class to be that issue, then of course the struggle begins to get even more real. So the chance class of trans transmitting a parasite or even infectious disease class definitely would increase as the density increases class. So keep in mind, class, there are two types. There are two types of competition that you all should be able to contrast on your test. They are as follows. The first of which class is intra, S-I-N-T-R-A, intraspecific competition. So I call intraspecific competition, that be competition class within a population, i.e. it's one species. So that would, of course, be a competition class between, let's just say, those individuals class of this particular species of grass. Let's say it may be, I don't know, Poa annua. Or maybe it's class just, I don't know, what's another grass species? Maybe it's Kogan grass, Imperata cylindrica. A in any case, class, that is competition between that species, between, of course, or within, I say, a population, intra-specific competition. The second of two types class is in ter, in ter specific competition. So in this type of competition class, this is competition between populations of multiple species. So this would maybe I would say be competition class between either of those two grass species, and I would say that tall tree growing there. Since that tree class is so tall and has a canopy that is so wide it class is taking the shade. And not just taking shade, but also, I would say, taking water. So they're competing class for those resources in limited supply. And it could very well class be the competition class between, I guess you say, the predator and prey. It might class be that the bass that are swimming class in that river are competing class with the brim. For what? Space. Even class food. The struggle class is real. I'll now continue. So what I'll nextly get to is, I guess I'll mention now, class, density independent factors. Density independent factors in just a moment. I'll continue on with competition just briefly here, class. I've already done this with you, but it's not being presented, class, in the presentation. So just keep in mind that as competition occurs, which you all will describe in your test, it's that interaction class. But of course, between those two individuals using, two or more, of course, individuals using or attempting to use, class, that same essential resource, and, of course, the use of that resource by one individual will definitely class reduce, reduce, reduce availability of that resource to other individuals. Hence, class, the resource is in them and it's why. So I've already gotten class to, of course, intra and inter-specific competition. Prepare yourselves, class, to describe those and, of course, be able to have an example with each as given class moments ago. So, now that I've gotten through that, it mentions interference competition class, meaning when a dominant individual obtains an adequate supply of that limited resource at the expense of others. Meaning I've mentioned that once. And then we have exploitation competition in which all individuals of that population are sharing that resource equally. So at high population densities, none of those will obtain an adequate amount, such as the moose class on the Isle Royale, on the Isle Royale. And here, just keep in mind that the effects of density-dependent factors. So in natural communities, meaning places that are natural class, it's not easy to evaluate those relative effects of density-dependent factors. And I won't get to this example class of the effects of lizards on spider population. I will not get to that example here. However, what I will now get to class is going to be density-independent factors. So here, class, what I'll say is these factors are typically class abiotic. You say abiotic? Yes, things such as those random weather events. In that class, these environmental factors class, not influenced by population size or density, class, they affect, I would say, 
all of those individuals in that population, regardless class of number, regardless class of density. For instance, it could have been a, it could have been a hurricane. The hurricane class will not just affect that one or this one. The hurricane class will affect all individuals, regardless class of number. The same class can be stated about a flood, or even class a drought, and even the blizzard. So just keep in mind that the tornado class will affect those individuals, no matter how densely populated, and no matter class, the size of that population. And it's all class based on something being random. So mosquito populations in Arctic environments class, it's not the case that the adult mosquito survives winter. So the entire population class will grow in the summer from those eggs that have hibernated class in the larval state. Now on to life history traits. So ecologists are here, class, trying to understand, I would say, those adaptive consequences of various life history traits. And, and with this class, I'll just go back to where we are now. So keeping in mind what I'm referring to here is I'm referring to things such as being fecund or being or exhibiting fecundity that ability class or potential to carry offspring and here I refer to things such as reproductive rate age at maturity being of course those parts and these things class of course are why this species class is as it is and you're saying you mean what the the simipowerus yes the simipowerus species or even class those iteroparous species. The iteroparous species. So, with this being the case, let's get to two different types of species, meaning those life history types class up there. We'll do class, we'll go through, excuse me, the R strategists or the R selected species and those K strategists or those K selected species. So, R strategists class, by definition, have traits that contribute to a high population growth rate. I.e., they have a small body size, short lifespan, early maturity, and little to no parental care. And sometimes, of course, I would say these species are weaker and less intelligent. So with this class, these species are found especially in those vulnerable or temporary and even unpredictable environments. And as I say this class, you can even call these species opportunists. And it's in places where long-term survival is likely low. Examples of such class includes insects. You gotta love those insects. And even, I say, the corals or even bacteria and salmon. And I'll even, I'll even add to this list class, mosquitoes and some grasses. Those are all our strategists. So to contrast, R strategists with K strategists, I say with those K strategists, that their traits maximize chances of surviving in an environment where the number of individuals is near carrying capacity. And as I state that, I, they do not produce large numbers of offspring. So these are those long-lived species. They have, they have those long lifespans. They have, of course, slow development, late reproduction, and a large body size with a low reproductive rate. So these species tend to be in relatively stable environments. So examples of these class, or at least before I get to examples, I say these species typical, typically are stronger and more intelligent, such as, I say, rain, most tropical rainforest trees, I say. And of course, not to speak to, of course, the tree's intelligence, but I mean examples of a species. And even class those redwood trees, which I love a redwood tree. I don't know if you've heard class, but those trees grow quite fast. Meaning in a year class, they can grow up to six feet. That's 12 months you all. On to life tables. So the life table can be constructed to show the mortality and survival data of a population. Or, of course, a cohort, which is a group of individuals of the same age at different times during their lifetime. Class, I'll be blunt, insurance companies, they love these, they use these. And and they were the first to use life tables to, of course, calculate that relationship class between a client's age and the likelihood of that client surviving 
to pay enough insurance premiums to cover the cost of that policy. Well, getting back to where we are today, class, ecologists construct such tables for animals and plants based on data that rely on a variety of population sampling methods and the age determining techniques. And to get to what's real, let's look at the gray squirrel. So this class shows a life table for a cohort of 530 gray, gray squirrels. So this is Sciurius carolinensis. Excuse me. So looking at this life table class, what can we infer about the gray squirrel? Alrighty, well, as you see this class, you can likely say you have never seen a 10-year-old squirrel. If you don't know what I mean, please look closer. And even the case, it's also quite likely, class, that most of the squirrels you have seen in your life have been five years or younger as far as age. So with this, the cohort class, yes, the entire proportion of the cohort were alive at the beginning of this interval, meaning from zero to one year. However, the proportion dying class is, is an approximate 75% from zero to one year. So you likely say, class, that most squirrels you see are, yeah, maybe two years old, but likely, class, less than two years old. So if you look closely, class, there are not many squirrels left, class, after that first year life. And if, if in fact, you like dealing with numbers and you just... I guess you say doing a bit of work with numbers, you can add class the proportion of squirrels dying at each of those age intervals. And you can say class that there is an approximate 89% of squirrels dead class after those two age intervals. Hence, I say class, the squirrels we see are not that old. So this is done class in ecology. And it's useful, very useful. And on that same no class, if in fact you're able to, to afford life insurance, I say it's a much better class to buy the life insurance earlier rather than later. On to survivorship. So getting on to survivorship in your class, I say that it's the probability that a given individual in a population or cohort, cohort will survive to a particular age and then plotting the logarithm, log base 10, of the number of surviving individuals against the age. And of course, this goes from birth to the maximum age reached by any individual. So this is how we get that survivorship curve. And there are three main survivorship curves recognized by ecologists. And you see them here, class. They have the type one survivorship curve, the type two survivorship curve, and the type three survivorship curves. And of course, survivorship class will be here on your X, and on the Y class would be what is called those individuals who are surviving. Or in other words, class, the number of survivors on that logarithmic scale to, of course, get those type 3, the type 2, and the type 1 survivorship curve, as we shall see here. So the type 1 survivorship curve, class. So here, those individuals that exhibit a type 1 survivorship class well, with time class, it decreases more rapidly with increasing age, and mortality is greater, greatest, excuse me, later in life. So I say again, the probability of survivorship class decreases more rapidly with increasing age, i.e. in humans. There's that type 1 survivorship curve, meaning the older we get class, the more likely it is for mortality class to be experienced. With a type 2 survivorship curve class, it doesn't change. Meaning survivorship does not change with age. Death class is likely in the beginning, or it is as likely class in the beginning as it is class throughout life. So here's that type 2 survivorship curve class, and some birds exhibit such, but also mentioned here class that it's not too often to see species exhibit a type 2 survivorship curve. Next to the class is that type 3 survivorship curve. So here with the type 3 survivorship curve, oysters do exhibit such, and survivorship increases. I repeat, the probability of survivorship increases 
with increasing age. But of course, the young class, excuse me, the chances of dying class increase with increasing age. And the young are most likely to die. Excuse me for misspeaking here. So as you can see, class in this type 3 survivorship curve, that yes, there are a number of those individuals class who begin life. But as almost as soon as those individuals class have begun their lives, their lives typically end. So to continue where we are, class, this shows a species of plant called flocks, or at least from the genus flocks. So it exhibits a type one structure curve. So after germination class, these individuals can live and live and live. And with this class, one reason for this may may very well be class that this is why it has escaped from cultivation class and of course has begun to survive outside of where it once was. So they grow class vegetatively class throughout those days that you listed here. And then of course they'd be in the flower and set seed. Next up class of course that type two curve you're seeing a class. Yes there's a bird. It is a herring gull. And with this, I mentioned already, class, that the probability of survival does not change over the, the, of course, lifespan. And some lizards, class, also exhibit a type 2 curve. And it doesn't show, class, the type 3 structure curve. I've already mentioned, class, here that with this, the probability of surviving class, of course, has decreased greatly, class, not, not long thereafter. And the mortality is greatest. I repeat, in the type 3 curve, the mortality is greatest class early in life. I see, I see again, the type 3 starts of curve class, mortality is greatest early on in life. And those intervals that avoid early death have a high probability of surviving because, of course, survival increases with age. It increases with age. So on to meta populations. So... To define a class briefly, and you find this in your textbook up on page 1163, is that this is a population that is divided into several local populations, among with individuals occasionally disperse or immigrate or immigrate. And they're doing that class between what I call good habitats or source habitats, where the reproductive success is greater than the local mortality and greater population densities are. And sink habitats, or those lower quality habitats, where which class are areas where those local reproductive successes are less than the local mortality. So without immigration class from other areas, of course, the declines until this extinction occurs. So the source and sink habitats class are linked their class by dispersal. So think of this class as being, of course, an environment that has this landscape with all of the interacting ecosystems, meaning those varieties of individual habitats, such as you would see class in the forest. And you'll find this class at Newfound Gap Road in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. It was so lovely to go here, class. And I say if ever you have that chance, please, A, be careful if you go, but, <laughs> but take in the sights because it's an amazing place to be. So during the summer, when all the vegetation is deep green, the landscape appears class more homogeneous, as opposed to, of course, being class heterogeneous or heterogeneous. So next thing we get down to a, a bit of information class about landscapes. And of course, this just consists of those interacting ecosystems, right? That variety of, of habitats, those patches. Hence I mentioned class the, the number of populations. So let's end this class upon being which we have the meta populations dividing into those several local populations with all of the dispersal and get into differing parts. There's already gotten to source and sink populations class. We did this moments ago. So of course the source class is something such as this that's here, those that are here. And of course a lot of populations being of course those sinks with lower quality populations. And you're seeing class the immigration occurring. So with human populations, it took thousands of years, class, for the human population to reach 1 billion in 1800. And as you can see, class, it took more and more and more years. But if you look closely, class, only 30 years were taken to go from 2 billion to 3 billion. And then there was an approximate 15 years 
to go from 3 billion to 4 billion, and then 12 years class to reach, of course, 5 billion and 6 billion, respectively. So, yes, we're now class at that approximate 7.6 billion, with projection class being to reach 8 billion, 2025. And I think class will get there sooner, given class the current data. The current data. So with human population growth, if you look closely, class, during the last 1,000 years, the population has been increasing, class, nearly exponentially, as I just gave you. And it's predicted, class, that the population will begin leveling out during the 21st century from that S curve that we mentioned, class, earlier. However, class, we just have yet to get there. So, of course, that recent increase in the population is due, of course, to a decrease in death rate, not necessarily that increase in birth rate. Class, people are living longer, i.e., food production is up. Better care class. Healthcare is, I say, the, the best it's ever been. And improved sanitation practices class are being, are being practiced. So, people now class live longer than people once lived. For instance, from 1920 to 2000, the death rate in Mexico class fell from 40 per 1,000 individuals to 4 per 1,000 individuals, and the birth rate dropped class from 40 per 1,000 individuals to 24 per 1,000 individuals. There we have it, class. So this class shows what was just given. This shows what was just given. So with zero population growth class to finish the chapter, it's that zero population growth, meaning the point at which birth rate equals death rate, will occur class toward the end of the 20th century. And the growth rate may continue to decrease class if that birth rate equals a death rate. It may, which of course will give us that logistic growth curve. So that's what's predicted. That is what's predicted. So next the class, Earth's carrying capacity. So this is where it gets good. Does it exist? We don't know. So that main unknown factor is, of course, just projecting the population growth, which may range from 4 billion to 16 billion humans, class. And could you imagine 16 billion people on Earth? So with these estimates, class, it's just, it's just not known. But I tell you this, Earth can support far fewer humans if everyone lives lifestyles common in those highly developed countries such as where we live class in the United States. So it's very interesting class what will be happening. And on to demography class and to demographics. So this is that science that deals with human population statistics such as the size, the density, and distribution, providing class further information. So, so with this we get to of course those highly developed countries and then those that are developing countries. And then those that are developing countries can then be, be further divided into being moderately developed and even those that are less developed. So those highly developed countries are those that, of course, are quite industrialized with low rates of population growth, <laughs> low birth rates, low infant mortality rates, long life expectancies, and those high, R P H I G H, with those high gross national incomes and that's in purchasing power parity and that's in purchasing power parity and that's per capita and then of course the moderately developing countries have birth rates and infant mortality rates are generally high but of course on the decline and moderate levels of industrialization with a lower average class the lower average of the, what I mentioned has been the gross national income in purchasing power parity. And then finally, class, in less developed countries, they are the ones, class, that have the highest birth rates and infant mortality rates, along with the lowest life expectancies and the lowest gross national income in purchasing power parity. And that, as I mentioned, class, now three times, is what I'm referring to as being an indicator class on the amount of goods and services the average citizen of that particular region or country class could buy in the United States. So with that, highly developed countries have, a, of course, a longer life expectancy class, being at 79 years at birth in the United States class versus 72 years worldwide. And when I mentioned class that 
gross national income in purchasing power parity. Of course, here in the United States class, it's $58,030. And worldwide, it's only $16,101. To give you an indicator and a bit of background on what I meant there. So this class gives you a bit more demographic information class as we get to about to end the chapter here. And as you can see, class, how to develop right here. Look at these numbers, class, compared to the numbers in those countries that are developing class and less developed. So this class is that difference, I would say, especially class when you come to life expectancy. That's that major difference. So the doubling time class is the amount of time it would take for a population of doubling size. And that doubling time class is what identifies it as being a highly, a moderately, or less developed country. So the shorter the doubling time, I repeat, the shorter the doubling time class, less developed the country is. So, in the United States class, the doubling time is their approximate 140 years, as opposed to class, the doubling time class being 30 for Ethiopia. So, I hope you can see that stark contrast. And then fertility rates. So, that's the number of children class a couple must produce to replace themselves, being that replacement of fertility level. So in high developed countries class, it's 2.1. And of course, 2.7 in those developing countries. Worldwide class is 2.6, well above replacement levels. So the fertility, the fertility rate must decline class for a population to stabilize. And who knows, of course, when it will decline or even why it will decline. And this class gives you input class into those fertility rates, at least in these developing countries. And look at class here back in 1960 to force 1965, as opposed to class as it is there in 2013. Do you see the change? Or the lack of change, I say class in the case of Nigeria. So with age structure class, this represents, of course, the number of males and females at each age from, of course, birth to death. And with that overall shape of the age structure diagram indicating whether a population is increasing, stationary, or shrinking. So for those less developed countries, the age structure diagram is shaped like a pyramid in less developed countries. So strong population growth momentum exists because the larger percentage of the population is pre-reproductive class being 0 to 14 years of age. And the probability class of future population growth is great. So even if fertility rates in these countries happen to decline to a replacement level, the population will continue to grow for some time. However, for those high developed countries, the age structure diagrams have a more tapered base, i.e. a small proportion of the population is pre-reproductive. So that diagram of the stable population shows approximately the same number of people at pre-reproductive and reproductive ages. So, in a population that is shrinking, the pre-reproductive age is smaller than either those that are reproductive or post-reproductive, i.e., looking at those two now here class, the less developed country being here at A, and those that are high developed countries being here class at B. So, to predict growth class, the world's population is more than doubled in size from 1950 to 2013, growing most in developing countries. So, people in developing countries had increased to almost 82% of the world's population. So that means that, of course, those most population increases for the 21st century will also take place in developing countries, and it's larger due class to their young age structures. So keep this in mind, class, that people in overpopulation class, meaning as it occurs in these developing nations, it occurs when the environment class is worsening from too many people, and even if those people consume few resources per person. So as this happens, class, this can most definitely overwhelm and deplete the natural resources class of the country. 
So in the affluent or high of nations, individual resources demands are large and far, I repeat, this is the key class, and far above requirements for survival. So the consumption class occurring with the population that occurs when people in the more affluent nations exhaust the resources and degrade the global environment class through excessive consumption, i.e., by way of our throwaway lifestyle. So this class is what may very well change things. I say forever. This has been your instructor, Scholar Huff, and I hope you all have learned something here in this lecture. So make sure you take notes well, and let me know, class, if I can help.